So good morning and welcome to the University of Kentucky College of Medicine January reception. I'm Wendy Jackson, Assistant Dean for Admissions for UKCOM, and we are delighted to be hosting all of you. In keeping with complete, complete and total transparency, our aim today is to highlight the greatness of UKCOM. We hope that when you depart today, we have left a last, lasting impression upon you and that you long to return here to pursue your medical education. Without further ado, I would like to present to you the Dean of the University of Kentucky College of Medicine, Dr. Robert DePaula. You don't need to, you don't need to clap, but I appreciate it. I appreciate you all being here, actually. I think uh, one of the great things and great opportunities for us is to at least fill you in on the College of Medicine, where we've been, where we're going, uh, and especially, I'm assuming this is working okay, um, and especially uh, our focus on, on building uh, various programs uh, for you all, uh, our, our students. Um, what, I, what I chose to do is I do have some slides, and, uh, and it gets a bit didactic, so um, you might need to take notes because we have a quiz at the end, um, <laughs> and uh, you'll get a little glimpse of how we pay attention to the detail uh, in terms of the curriculum, you know, feeds into the curriculum. Just so you know, too, we have uh, over a thousand faculty, uh, and that includes um, you know, physicians and researchers and educators, uh, and really everybody working together as a team. And we pay a lot of attention uh, to bringing everyone together uh, for our program and our curriculum to really address the needs uh, we have in healthcare. And uh, listed here are some of the needs, uh, and actually the ranking in terms of how uh, pressing a need these are uh, in the state of Kentucky, especially. Um, which actually speaks to the opportunities for students to see how we address those needs. I mean, we actually turn out to be number one in cancer mortality as a, as a state, fairly high in lung disease and addiction, uh, although that's an epidemic around the country. In fact, most of these are an epidemic around the country, diabetes and heart disease, and, you know, et cetera, just to name, uh, to name a few. But if you really look at our mission, and we have kind of a slide here that talks about our strategic plan, everything we do on the education end and the research end uh, is really to educate the future physicians uh, so that they can take the very best of new discoveries and get them into the clinic and help our patients and people in need and health and wellness um, as immediately as possible. Um, this is uh, kind of a word cloud and uh, in kind of a, in, the, in the, you know, the silhouette of the, of the state. And what it represents is a long process, a year uh, process of a strategic plan with input from our faculty, our students, our staff, and the font size relates to the whole question of what is the purpose of a college of medicine. And you can see there, you know, research and education and health care and, you know, a lot about Kentucky, you know, not just athletics, but on uh, applying, um, which have been doing very well lately, um, but applying um, all of what we have in terms of uh, research and new technology um, towards, uh, towards patients in need uh, in a state where there are opportunities for you all as students to see everything from kind of the inner city needs of a community um, to the more rural needs uh, out in, in various aspects in various areas of, uh, you know, of Kentucky. But really bringing it all together, and I'll show you a few examples in a moment just to give you some idea. Um, we do pay attention to kind of all the areas of, of intersection between education and research and clinical care. We pay a lot of attention to diversity and inclusion, and you'll hear a little more about that uh, in, a, in a little while uh, in terms of well-being and well-being of our students uh, and, uh, and our community engagement efforts on how uh, we get the very best of care and cutting-edge therapies out into the community. Um, thinking about the community, we've grown. Um, I mentioned we have over a thousand faculty. Um, we are headed towards, um, with the new campus expansions, uh, approximately 800 total medical students, which is a fairly large and strong college of medicine. Um, we've, we've done that by having new campuses, as you know, uh, in Bowling Green, as you can see in the lower left, um, the campus here in Lexington in the, in the middle, uh, the new campus up in northern Kentucky, uh, and then our Moorhead campus for our third and fourth year students where we have students in what we call the Rural Physician uh, Leadership uh, Program. Um, the opportunities in the various sites will uh, lead to some different exposures and so forth, but you'll hear in a little while the curriculum is exactly the same. We stick to one curriculum, in fact we need to. Uh, and so um, every single student in every single site will be getting the same education uh, with various community opportunities in terms of exposure. Uh, and students in, in any one of the sites even have opportunities in various electives 
to connect with other aspects of the community throughout the state. In fact, the, you could see there the, uh, the kind of the stars represent various uh, electives and opportunities for our students and, and opportunities that they've had uh, to kind of be in a community in, in various aspects of the state. So you can see they're all over the state as well. This depicts um, one of our earliest uh, training um, venues um, in, uh, in the College of Medicine back in about 1961. Um, when the College of Medicine was first started, about 1960-61. And what you see is the medical students uh, back then up in the window observing a surgery uh, down at the table there. And so this is kind of the, you know, the way, uh, you know, students were taught um, now. And you'll hear uh, more from Dr. Fedak in a little, uh, in a little while. It's much more interactive. Uh, the other thing is, is knowledge keeps growing at a rapid pace. So we've got to think about new diagnostics and new technology on a regular basis. And what that leads us to do is pay a lot of attention to our research base. So that there's new discoveries happening all the time in the College of Medicine so that our students are exposed to cutting edge therapies, therapies that are emerging and understanding that. Um, and so if you had to kind of depict where things are going, it's starting to become more and more uh, a picture of what you see on the right. And that is, you know, a team and on the table there would be researchers and physicians uh, and other healthcare practitioners in different ways getting together in a more team-like approach to approach, you know, new diagnostics, new therapies, um, and, you know, the students in the back and so forth. And what that actually depicts, this, this cartoon here, uh, is, a, is a real patient uh, case uh, or situation um, in what we call a, a molecular tumor board. Uh, in our cancer center, they have this pretty regularly, uh, and on the screen, what they're all observing, okay, so on the left, and, you know, they were observing a surgery. Here they're observing all the data and information on a particular patient. It turns out to be a 12-year-old girl um, who had uh, brain cancer. It spread throughout her body and spine, and, and believe it or not, that, that is supposed to depict uh, that picture there in an MRI. Um, and usually, you know, uh, you know students, and in, 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 uh, as they, as they uh, become physicians, learn physical diagnosis and how to interpret x-rays and how to interpret blood work. And what's on the left is interpreting actually even gene changes. You know, nowadays there's this whole concept of precision medicine. In fact, I don't know how many of you have heard of 23andMe. You can just raise your hand if you've heard of, you know, it's almost like everybody. So you can get your own gene analysis. Um, it, it actually speaks to the way diagnostics are changing the way we think about, about medicine. As, as physicians and, and researchers, we need to understand how to embrace that in a positive way, in an evidence-based way for our patients. And what this is, a molecular tumor board, this particular you know, patient, when they did a gene analysis um, of, her, um, of her actual cancer, they found three gene alterations that are actually driving the cancer to be a cancer. And the first one, as it turns out, not that you have to remember, since we're not really doing a, a quiz here, um, you, know, the, you know, the BRAF mutation, as it turns out, um, is a gene alteration commonly found, not in brain cancer that is spread, but in adult melanoma, adult skin cancer. And there was an effective therapy then, um, you know, an oral agent that targets exactly that particular gene alteration. And because of the new technology and putting a multidisciplinary team together, we're able to get her a, a therapy that we wouldn't have even known about uh, without some of the newer technologies. And so it's not, it's not just the evidence of today, it's the evidence as it's emerging, uh, you know, going on and how you interpret that to the benefit of a patient in different ways. And that's why it's so important to have a strong research base at a college of medicine where discoveries are happening and students have exposure to see how do you apply that to patient care, not just today, but in the future. If you were to ask how, how much uh, uh, new uh, knowledge occurs on a regular basis, um, there is a doubling of new evidence in the medical literature every, what do you think? Anybody want to guess? One year, two years, 10 years, 20 years? It's actually four years about, about every four years. So you all as entering students, in about four years from now, you're going to have to like figure out how to keep up with about a doubling. Um, the truth is, we, we help you figure that out and not only understand what's going on today, but to learn for the future. And having exposures like this allow that in a, in a better way. So we pay a lot of attention to kind of this type of a, of a cartoon where you say, or diagram, to, you know, that we want to get science and evidence and then evidence-based care into care as rapidly as possible. 
And we're doing that here with an emphasis, we actually call the whole College of Medicine strategy a transdisciplinary strategy by bringing people to, to the table all at once in you know, kind of a, an evidence-based team, like the example of the, of the precision medicine 12-year-old uh, girl example I gave a moment ago. Um, and when you really want to measure it and say, well, what's the strength of a College of Medicine in terms of its new discoveries and cutting-edge therapies and so forth, one measure, one great measure, I think it's probably the best measure, is the ability of our faculty, okay, the instructors and researchers that are teaching, uh, teaching you all, um, uh, their ability to compete for awards throughout the U.S., federal grant awards, because they compete against other researchers and other institutions throughout the whole U.S. on a regular basis. And probably one of the easiest measures and best measures is the amount of NIH or National Institute of Health funding that a, a college of medicine able, is able to um, acquire and be awarded uh, in, in a competitive nature like that. And what that really represents is the newest of discoveries and activity. And we've paid a lot of attention, especially in the last few years, to really grow our base of discovery and cutting edge therapies. And these are the, the actual numbers of our NIH, uh, NIH funding, you know, uh, in terms of uh, back two years ago, you know, 67, you can see in 2016, we already jumped up to 83 and then 102. So this is just giving you a little, little bit of a glimpse of how we pay attention to the foundation of what then feeds up to evidence-based therapies and then cutting-edge therapies in the education uh, for a future, a, a kind of a future of medicine. And this is one example. I'll just give you an example of a team that we've paid a lot of attention to. We started a program that helped facilitate some of that growth so that our students would have exposure to, you know, cutting-edge therapies. And you'll see, you know, a little bit, you're going to get to talk to some of the students, some of which have uh, actually been involved um, with this particular uh, example. This is a, a, we, a program we started a, at least a few years ago called the Multidisciplinary Value Program. And what we did is we awarded teams um, of researchers that had new discoveries that could get, in, get it into cutting-edge therapies in the clinic in the form of clinical trials, but we basically challenged them to do it more rapidly and today. And this is an example of one of those teams, and this is one of the reasons we've seen such growth in the last couple of years uh, in terms of our overall research and new discoveries and discoveries that are getting into the clinic. So this is a team with Dr. led by Dr. Gregory Bix and Justin Frazier. Dr. Bix is a laboratory researcher. He works on looking at strokes, especially embolic strokes, so large vessel strokes where uh, a vessel is cut off, the blood supply to the brain is cut off, and the picture to the left is depicting kind of a clot or a thrombus uh, in a large vessel uh, in the brain, um, causing a stroke, causing brain damage. Uh, and when patients come into an emergency room with a stroke such as this, in, in places where they have the, the best technology, like the University of Kentucky College of Medicine and UK Healthcare, um, a technique where they would put a catheter in to, to go into the vessel, and that's the little blue, um, uh, kind of where the arrow is um, uh, depicted in the, in the picture on the left, would go in and pull out that clot and allow reperfusion of the, of the brain. Now one of the problems is, so it helps, but one of the problems is there can still be some brain damage. What Dr. Bix in the laboratory found is that while the catheter is in there, since it's a tube, if you additionally infuse some therapies that we know about and are very easy to use these days, such as magnesium and verapamil, um, you're able to actually open up the vessels and change the system in the brain uh, and, and around the area of damage in a way that it improves perfusion and there's, and there's reduced brain damage significantly, and it's impressive. Now, he's doing that in the laboratory, figuring that out. Typically, when you look at that kind of curve from science to evidence to care, people always quote it could take 10 years before a new therapy is brought into the clinic. We challenged this team, and all within a year, they launched a clinical trial so that patients now, this is, this is with Dr. Frazier. Dr. Frazier is a neurosurgeon. He's in the clinic a lot and also does research with Dr. Bix. Um, he's actually one of the physicians who puts the catheter in and pulls out the, the clot. Well, they created in this as a team approach a clinical trial so that patients coming in now to our emergency room at the University of Kentucky have the option of not only the catheter procedure, but enrolling in a clinical trial with these new therapies. And this is how new cutting-edge therapies get into medicine uh, in, in what we would consider, um, you know, a, a very important approach to, to looking at how you, how you approach the future, you know, future of medicine. Um, 
And then just to give you one last uh, you know, tidbit to see and, and give you a, a sense of how um, we pay attention to research and discoveries that might seem totally distant from the clinic and we bring it together. Uh, and again, given you know, exposure to, you know, to our students so that they understand you know, how it goes from discovery to a clinical trial to a new standard therapy uh, and how you pay attention to that over your years of practice. Um, whether you practice in a university setting, whether you practice in a private, uh, you know, in a private uh, practice setting, um, or whether you do research or whether you don't. But to keep up with that doubling of, of evidence, um, you might think that it's obscure to think about something this laboratory-based. And what this is on the left uh, is, is a Mexican salamander. And Mexican salamanders, if you don't know, um, are almost about a foot long, so they're really large salamanders. But there's an interesting thing about salamanders. If you cut off a limb or you cut into the salamander, they regenerate, okay? If you cut a spinal cord or in a, in a trauma situation uh, in, a, you know, in, a, in a person, it doesn't regenerate. And you, you, know, uh, you know all of the needs that we have, uh, whether it's, you know, it's brain trauma or whether it's spinal cord trauma, uh, regeneration and, and capturing that would be an important thing. The way we approach that here is we recruited to the College of Medicine one of the national superstars in salamander regeneration medicine research to the College of Medicine but we don't leave him alone. We put him at the table, similar to the Justin Frazier example with Dr. Bix, at the same table because he really understands and his whole team from Salamander Research the kind of factors and things that might make a difference so that we can actually see those things have a greater, at least, speed to getting to the clinic and cutting edge therapies. And so this is at least some of the, you know, some of the research opportunities and exposures that we have, but most importantly, the application to uh, our patients uh, going forward, and even more importantly, equipping all of you as you go through your training to not only know, you know, you know how, to, how to treat diabetes today and how to treat cardiovascular disease or a problem today or, or a particular cancer today, but how do we look for those new therapies tomorrow so that you're, you're the very best throughout your, whole, uh, through, uh, throughout your whole career. So I'm gonna stop with that. I won't, I won't quiz you. I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Chris Fedock, who is our uh, senior associate dean for education, and I think you're going to bring uh, some students to the table, and we'll get them up here. So thank you. Thank you, Dean DePaula. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see everyone here. You know, for the rest of this hour, our goal is is really to make sure that you understand what we are all about here. So we're really going to focus the next 45 minutes on our educational system here. I'm gonna challenge you all to ask questions, okay? I'll do a brief presentation and then our expert student panel will be glad to take any questions that you have um, in order to answer them. Just to start out, let me have the panel introduce themselves, what year they are in school and where they did their undergrad. Hello, can you all? Here we go. We had to do this last time, so <laughs> we're used to passing the mic. So um, my name is Andrew Woodrich. Um, I'm originally from outside of Detroit, Michigan, and I went to undergrad at the University of Miami in Florida, and I am now a second year in the medical school here. <coughs> my name's Trent Gooden. I'm originally from Versailles. Um, I'm a third year, and I did my undergrad at Tulane. Hello, my name is Carter Boffman. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm a second year student, and I went to Center College. And I'm Victoria Jones, a first year medical student from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I went to North Carolina Central University in Durham. And then when we get to the question and answer, uh, we're going to have Michelle and Jane, and let me have Michelle and Jane uh, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Michelle from Ball. I am originally from Ashland, Kentucky. I'm a fourth year medical student, and I went to undergrad at New York University. Hi, I'm Jane Bengako. Um, I'm a first year medical student. I'm originally from Cameroon, West Africa, and I went to University of Kentucky for undergrad. All right, well, welcome everyone. Let's start off by just talking about our curriculum. Um, and this is kind of the big picture of where our curriculum is. We really think about our curriculum in three distinct phases, okay? The first phase is the core principle phase, where we're really establishing the foundations of medicine. Um, and trying to make sure that all of our students have the basis to be prepared to actually enter clinical um, experiences, which is, of course, our second phase, which is what we call our application phase. 
And this is what many people would consider kind of the core clinical rotations. What are those experiences that every medical student should have within the clinical setting to give them that foundational knowledge of how to practice medicine? And then finally, we have our advanced development phase in blue. And the advanced development phase is really where we think about what do we need to do to get those students to where they want to be, right? So this is going to be much more student-directed, right? What are those electives? What are those experiences that are going to get our students to be successful into whatever career path they want to do? And how do we make sure that they are ready to transition into a residency program? Now let's just dive a little bit more into each of those phases. Um, when we talk about that initial phase, I think one of the most important things that we've tried to do in that initial phase is really blend that foundational science with clinical science. And I think to Dean's DePaula about how important that is, his example of how important that is in research is just as important in education. As he mentioned that doubling time, there is no way to know everything anymore. It's impossible. So we have to make sure that we are on the cutting edge, knowing what is happening in, in the fields that is going to affect medicine of tomorrow, but also knowing and understanding, well, how do we practice this in the clinical setting? And that marriage of having a PhD and an MD lead every single one of our courses really provides that great perspective. And we want to integrate thinking about function and dysfunction. How, we want you to learn comprehensively about each system and understand how those, those different systems interact. We also have this kind of longitudinal development because I think there are other aspects outside of just the practice of medicine, the, the prescribing of medications and diagnostic tests and everything else. And those are the things that affect us every day. Medical ethics, population health, evidence-based medicine. How do we know when that evidence is, is produced, how do we integrate that into our clinical settings? How do we in, have that influence our practice? The other thing we try to emphasize in the core principles phase is really the early development of clinical skills. We start interviewing and physical examination very early so that all students have those skills and are prepared to go into the clinical settings within this phase. In the next phase, when we really consider those clinical rotations, we really want an immersive experience. You need to really be part of a team on those different disciplines to truly understand how to practice uh, medicine. Um, one unique aspect of our curriculum is we actually have a longitudinal course throughout all of those clinical rotations. Because it's one thing to develop skills bouncing between different specialties, but it's very helpful to have someone, a coach, who is watching your clinical development over that entire year and making sure that you are developing improved proficiency at each stage, improving how you think through your clinical reasoning, refining those clinical skills. Then we also want to further develop the, the systems thinking. So now you're really immersed in the clinical setting. Now all of a sudden there's a lot of practicalities. What about patient safety and quality improvement in the healthcare system that we work under? How do you better understand how to be effective in all of those situations? And we have that as a thread throughout our entire application phase. Then last, our advanced development phase. You know, our goal here really is, is to bridge that gap between medical school and residency. You know, if you read in the lay press, they always talk about, you know, July phenomenon and all of these things about there's a huge difference between being a medical student and doing a lot of watching and becoming an intern and suddenly doing a lot of doing. And we have to make sure that our students are prepared for that. So we have acting internships where we expect our students to truly function as the primary caregiver, function exactly how they would as they start their internship. We also have a final course, Transition to Residency, where we really try to ensure that every student has the skills that they're going to need on day one of residency. Very practical skills. We do a lot of simulation. We do a lot of clinical situations in that course. The last thing I'll mention about this final phase is we try to be very flexible. Every student, as they are nearing the end of their medical school careers, are going to have slightly different needs, slightly different directions that they're going to go. Some are going to need that flexibility in order to schedule interviews, go on away rotations, whatever it may be, right? And our goal really is with that phase is to have that personal skill development to get you to whatever residency you desire, okay? So when we look at all of these things, we really have an emphasis. One of our major points of emphasis really is on clinical skills development. Um, in the first year, we have this introduction to clinical medicine course where we really emphasize those interviewing skills, patient communication skills. 
We transition into our second year into an advanced clinical medicine course where once again, we talk, focus more on clinical reasoning. How do you take that history and physical exam and put it all together to come up with a diagnosis for the patient? And how do you communicate that, either in writing or when you present to, a physician, to another physician? And then finally, that entrustment in clinical medicine course during the application phase is really all about that clinical coaching and those procedural skills. How do you make sure that you're proficient in all of those skills? Another aspect that we've developed um, in the past year has been scholarly concentrations. And these are really optional programs for students who want to take a deeper dive. Maybe there's an area that you really want to focus in on. We have three right now, bioethics, clinical and translational research, and global health. And this is really about using some of those electives that you would in your first and second year, again in your fourth year, and having a scholarly project throughout your medical school career. And this is just a way for you to get a more thorough understanding in some of these fields. We've got more that are in development, um, but these are the three that we have right now. I'm gonna skip questions really quick, and then we'll go turn to our panel, but just to take a second to talk about student life. You know, we talk a lot about academics, but to be successful, there are some pillars that you really need to be successful. And these are the five that we think about when we think about how can we make students successful. The first is purpose. How can we help you find your best path in medicine? How can we help you find that path that is perfect for you? And I think we think about electives and, and those scholarly concentrations and specialty interest groups and all of those things to help you define what it is that's important to you. Well-being, there's been a lot written about the difficulties of well-being, not only among physicians, but residents and students. And we have to dedicate that a well individual is gonna be far more successful. So we have numerous resources that we dedicate to make sure that our students can be successful in their medical careers. Then we go to social awareness, and I think there's a huge part about understanding the community that we live in, whether it be Lexington, the state of Kentucky, the United States, the world. And we've got various aspects on every levels for students to better understand that. Academic engagement, obviously you need to be engaged in your studies, but we wanna be able to support that. And so we actually have an entire academic support team um, that includes academic counseling and tutors to make sure that students can make the most out of their medical school careers. I think they would all agree, medical school's entirely different and every student is going to struggle at some point during their career. Whether it be first year, second year, third year, or fourth year, everyone has their struggles, and we wanna be there to support them. And then last, community. How do you be a part of the College of Medicine? You can be a part of the administrative structure, whether it's being a part of the admissions committee, whether it's being part of curriculum committee, or many of our other committees, but maybe it's just student, other aspects of student life. Some of those uh, community activities, intramural sports, social activities, and things like that. So there's obviously a lot of areas to get involved in in the College of Medicine. Uh, now we have embarked upon a new initiative um, this year about a structure on how to do that. And many of you are probably familiar with the Hogwarts houses and I think that's probably the best example. Um, actually Carter and Trent um, were major influences in developing this system um, and I think they took some inspiration from Hogwarts. But through there, uh, you know, we're not wizards, Hogwarts. though we'd like to be at times, um, but we are in the state of Kentucky, so we have houses of horses, right? So that's where we are, right? So we've named all of our houses after horses. And this is a busy slide, but really we use our houses as a way to create a smaller environment within the larger environment and engage our students at every level, whether it be on class um, um, decisions, whether it be on how do we make students successful, um, how do we get involved in social and community service, professionalism, wellness, all of those things. You know, you, there are 201 incoming students this year. There will be 35 in Northern Kentucky, 30 in Bowling Green, and 136 in Lexington, which are including the 10 RPLP students. That's a big community, right? When you consider all four classes, that's a huge community. But this is our way of taking that huge community and really making sure that each student feels engaged. And so these are just some of the events from the last year um, of, of really the students taking a smaller perspective, getting engaged with different students, and you know, thinking about those five pillars about how we can be successful in medical school. All right, with that, we are open to questions. So please raise your hands um, if you have a question about any aspect of the College of Medicine and myself or, or 
mainly the panel, will, will take any of those questions. All right, well, as you are thinking of questions, right, thinking very hard of questions, um, let, let me have each of our panel members just explain, uh, you know, perhaps what convinced them uh, to come to the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. Okay, can you all hear me? <laughs> I try, I try. Um, so I'm an MD-PhD student, so for me research was very important in my decision, and the University of Kentucky, uh, highlighted by Dean DePaula, has a very strong reputation uh, for doing excellent research, and beyond that there's just a plethora of researchers in the fields that I'm interested in here. Um, so that was the, the first big draw for me to the university, but really what sold it to me was when um, I came here and I've lived in places in my life where people aren't as nice as they are here. So really, it was the people who were just nice and kind for no other reason than just to be nice and kind and caring that really sold me. And like Dr. Fedok said, medical school can be challenging. So I really wanted to go to a place that I felt welcome and included and where I could be myself and it didn't feel cutthroat or, or anything like that. I wanted a place where I felt like I could succeed and all my friends could succeed and it wasn't me versus them or us versus them, it was all of us together. And I really got that vibe here and throughout my first two years that, that has really come true and I've, I've really been happy with my choice because I think that with student wellness being such an important thing, I think being in a place where people care about you and you know that you know everybody out there wants you to be the best version of yourself, um, I think that's a very rewarding environment in which to study and learn medicine because eventually we're going to be the ones taking that attitude and that um, way we carry ourselves to our patients. And I think that really comes through. And on my clinical experiences thus far, I've really been able to see that and see how the, the culture of kind of congeniality here um, and working together really, really translates into better research and to better patient care as well. Yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of that, too. For me, it, it just came down to, to fit. Um, I, I remember coming to interview day, and you know everyone was just so kind and welcoming. And everything was so personal, too. Like People actually knew my name. Um, even like afterwards, when I had to call back for a question, like, like oh, yeah, Trent, like, yeah, I remember you. Um, so that was really nice. Um, everything was kind of low-key on interview day, too, so I liked that a lot. Um, but then, you know, doing like further research on schools, like everything about UK just seemed really solid. Like, you know, when, it, you're, when you're trying to make a decision, like you try to be really nitpicky and find something wrong with a place. And I couldn't really find anything wrong with UK. Um, and I, you know, it, it just came down to it being a good fit for me and feeling comfortable and um, thinking I'm going to get a great education. And I am getting a great education here. Um, well, I'll echo what they said just about the fit, you know, just feeling like it was the right place for me. Um, but there were also some specific opportunities that UK had that really drew me here. Um, I kind of came in interested in everything and not knowing what I wanted to focus on. You know, I was interested in doing research, interested in global health, interested in academic medicine and service and, you know, didn't really know what I wanted to focus on. And here you can, they have opportunities for it all. And you can kind of do it all too to see what you're interested in. You know, like I um, am doing a, a research year-long fellowship program, um, which they have the opportunity to do here for many students. I also got to take a medical Spanish class to see if, you know, maybe global health um, is what I want to focus on. And we have the Salvation Army Clinic, which is just an amazing opportunity to do service. Um, it's a completely student-run free clinic where it's, you know, students volunteer their time twice a week. Um, and so that's just another avenue where you can see if maybe that's kind of what you want to do. So for me, it was just, they had so many opportunities that I wanted to take advantage of. And then one other thing I'll touch on is that they really care about their student wellness. Um, there was a student initiative um, that was started a couple years back called Resilient, and it's just all about student wellness and making sure students are connected to each other and feeling supported. And so I just thought that was really important um, that they value that so strongly here. And um, 
I don't know about you all, but this was one of my favorite applications. Um, they're supplemental questions. I really felt that they were trying to get to know me as a person. Uh, the interview was also a confirmation. And since I've started school, uh, just the community and the environment, the culture here is wonderful. From the teachers to our classmates, our cohort is just very close. Um, we share resources with each other, and we just all want each other to succeed. I also love the way that um, clinical experiences are stressed here, and you don't have to wait until third year to get them. And uh, I, I heard once, go to a school that not just tolerates you, but celebrates you. So keep that in mind, and I really do feel like we're all celebrated here. All right. What questions do we have from the audience? Please raise your hand. I see a question up there. Jane will bring you a microphone, and we're getting her steps in. That's right. Uh, I have a general question for everyone on the panel that wants to answer it. Uh, what are some of the habits and practices that you have that have helped you succeed in medical school? You're making them think very hard. This is a good question. Um, I'll, I'll start with that, and uh, thank you for assuming that we're all succeeding. <laughs> um, really appreciate that. That's a big boost to my self-esteem. <laughs> um, I think um, one thing to stress is, is what Dr. Fedak hinted at earlier, too, is this is different. Being in graduate or professional school is a different mindset than being an undergrad or even having some, some of you have probably worked or, or done research in, in, in the interim. Um, I think coming in with a mindset that this is, this is a job and it's, an, and it's an occupation and trying to hold yourself to the standard of a physician and a professional physician at that um, has really helped, I think, kind of in my mind approach my daily activities with a different mindset. Um, some of that includes, you know, just being on a regular schedule, you know, I don't sleep in very often. It's, you know, I'm up at a certain time, I'm at bed at a certain time, I'm kind of at school or on campus from, you know, eight or nine in the morning till five or six or seven at night every day, and I kind of hold that schedule, and that's been really helpful to me. Um, and, you know, some of the more specific stuff we will definitely be hitting on when you guys come for your orientation. Um, in late July, there's much more specifics about how to actually, you know, do this or do that or, you know, what's worked for others. But I think in general, just kind of approaching medical school as a job and as a, as a, the first step in your lifelong career, I think is, is really one way to um, make sure that you're successful, not only in medical school, but preparing you to be successful uh, for your career as a physician. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that, especially, you know, going into in the third year, like having regular sleep habits, um, finding time in the day to, you know, do things for yourself, like exercise. Um, having good organizational skills um, is helpful. Um, people keep planners, trackers. I use um, Google Calendar like crazy. Um, that's all good stuff. Um, as far as first year... Yeah, treating it like a job, trying to come, come to campus, come to class. Um, setting mini goals for yourself to say, oh, I'm going to study five hours today. Um, I think it's really helpful. So those are maybe some things that you start practicing now. Yeah, I think most everyone will tell you that a schedule is, you know, r really important. I am a planner down to the T, so I, I plan all, I make crazy to-do lists, but then you get to check off a lot of things and it feels good. Um, so to do listen my friend um, I think another thing just to keep you successful and keep you inspired is especially throughout the first couple years you know you'll be taking a lot of tests and a l I have a lot of classmates who will have a test in the morning and then they'll choose that afternoon to shadow so it'll kind of re-inspire you remember why you're here in the first place um, so I think doing some things like that doing things you enjoy to just keep you um, you know a well-rounded person will help as well uh, as far as academics, I think repetition is the key. Um, so just keep going over the information, get creative in your mnemonics and different stories for how to remember it. And it helps to butt heads with other people in your class and form study groups so you can learn from other people. Uh, 
I think as far as careers go, stay open-minded because there have been a few interest groups that I didn't know much about and now I'm interested in them. So, And then also just keep your support system. So a lot of you all are here with your parents. Just know that they love you and they want you to succeed and so keep them updated and whatnot. That'll help. Other questions? You all have been saturated, huh? All, everything answered. So I know you guys are really busy, probably all the time, uh, but what do you do for fun? I think that's important, right? Yeah. It's very important. Um, yeah, I think I think everybody does stress how how busy you are in medical school, but I think people often overlook how much actual free time you still have. <laughs> I mean, even consider you work 12 hours a day, which I'm not implying that any of us really do that. You're usually yeah, that's that's a lot. You usually are awake, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. That still leaves you four, six hours. And this is on the most extreme. This is like day before a test studying. Like that's still four to six hours. I go to the gym. I love to cook, which is really important to me. So I always take some time out of the day to cook. I hang out with friends. Like I know we were just talking about going out tonight, like hanging out with some friends. Um, it's even even when you're studying, we do things that are fun. I know Carter and I and a, a group of friends of ours, we have a study group that we often meet up and we just kind of quiz each other over, over content. But honestly, half the time we're just joking around too and having fun. Like you, you can incorporate kind of free time and fun activities into your study routine as well. So that really can ease the burden of, you're not just like sitting there reading a book the whole time like being isolated, you there's lots of opportunities, and the, Lexington is a really fun town too. There's a lot going on, especially when the horses are running. That's always a good time. Every class usually has a, a tailgate set up, at least uh, you know for most of the weekends that that Keeneland's going. So um, there's lots of really fun o uh, uh, opportunities to to go out, and I know um, being. Um, active is, is important for a lot of us. I know there's lots of people who go hiking. We're not that far from the gorge, which is excellent, excellent hiking. Um, you know, the gyms here, there's one in this new building that's quite nice, and then the gym closer to uh, the medical school building is um, really convenient. It's basically on my walk home, so going to the gym most days is very important. I know t not only to me, but to a lot of my fellow classmates. What else do you guys do for fun? Um, I think another thing we haven't mentioned too, is especially first and second year, you kind of make your own schedule, right? Like you're expected to study, but if you know you want to take a weekend off or a afternoon off, you can do that. Say you want to go to the gorge and go hiking. Um, as far as what I do or what my classmates do, um, I play indoor soccer. I go for runs. Um, I go hiking. Uh, there's some great biking around here too. Um, Lexington's a fun town at night, too, so we do that. Um, go to Kentucky Theater a lot. Um, I know our social chairs are pretty active in like planning parties and um, that sort of thing. We plan a lot of other events, too, um, for students. Um, we have a mixer coming up with the law school here in February, so that should be fun. So there's, th there's always things going on if, if you're looking for something to do. Yeah, I'll echo that. Um, um, you really, if you're smart with your time your first two years, you really do have more time than you realize just because, you know, you only have class in the morning for the most part, and so your schedule's what you make, it, make of it. Um, like this next weekend we have MLK day off, and I'm leaving Friday after a test and going to Portland for the long weekend. So you'll have time to do things like that um, if you schedule it in addition to all those fun things that they mentioned. I like to play the piano, so I brought my little keyboard and keep it in my room and play it. Actually, um, they have a humanities festival, which is kind of like a talent showcase, if you will, and I participated in that this year, and it's nice to see what my other classmates 
musical talents or other talents they have. And then um, I'm not really into basketball, but my brother, <laughs> he came up, flew up here because UK was playing UNC Greensboro, and that's where he graduated from. I feel like a traitor because I was kind of rooting for them, but <laughs> 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 anyway, it was still, that was fun to me. Other questions? Okay, we'll take the top mic first and then we'll come around here. Okay, my question is how well did you guys feel prepared for your first year? And if you have any advice uh, for us since we're starting in the fall? So we got, we got a question similar to this in the last session, um, and our resounding uh, answer was relax. Um, don't worry. The curriculum um, has been designed, and meticulously so, to be comprehensive and to prepare you very well for everything you need. Um, there are students in my class who came in as performing arts, fine arts majors, and their, their background in the sciences was not as not as comprehensive as, as some coming in with science backgrounds and honestly they are no they are not behind they're excelling in our curriculum you don't need to do anything over the summer I know um, I w we were talking about this in the break too that like you know kind of the urge is like oh should I buy a biochemistry book should I do like an anatomy course or something our curriculum prepares you quite well you don't need to do any background homework take time you guys have been accepted you should celebrate relax um, feel confident that your undergraduate careers prepared you for this and even if you feel like it didn't feel confident that our curriculum will prepare you for everything you need for to be a good doctor we're it's designed such that you come in with the prerequisites you will succeed in the curriculum and you know everybody has their strong suits you know I majored in neuroscience, so the neuro neuroscience course was more familiar to me than other courses, but honestly, it didn't, didn't leave my, me and my peers at, 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 a, at a kind of a discrepancy whatsoever. So that, that's generally our advice, right? Yeah, yeah so just relax. <laughs> yeah, you're in, yeah. you made it. Other particular med school housing options or? Are there? So there, there are options for graduate housing <laughs> here, though I will honestly tell you, I am, I think there's a minority of students that take advantage of those and they, they uh, probably all have their own suggestions. Victoria, did you want to take that? Uh, they do have on-campus housing. It might be a little bit more expensive. Um, but when, have you all started getting newsletters? Uh, if not yet. Okay, not yet. But anyway, they'll Right send after this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will always look forward to those newsletters because they would have a housing option and you would have uh, upperclassmen, like they would make a Word document and people who are searching for roommates or uh, telling you about other options available. So they'll help you. I would say um, for the most part, I would say most people live off campus, but still within a mile or two. Um, and then some people who, you know, love to bike or love to run might live farther out just um, based on their choice. But I would say most people live within a couple mile radius. Yeah, and to kind of follow that up, like you, you can definitely find housing that is close enough to walk. I know lots of people walk to campus, lots of people bike. But if you do have a car, the, the parking lot is not far. I drive probably a 10 minute drive here and it's perfect for what I'm looking for. Um, and Lexington's a very livable city. Um, so I think housing is something that, you know, you can find what you're looking for, I think, in um, somewhere close to campus if you're interested, somewhere a little more removed if that's what you're interested in. All right, we've got time left for probably a couple more questions. If anyone has anything else. get you a mic real quick. Thank you, Michelle. The speaker mentioned earlier uh, of every student having challenges. I was wondering if you all had any stories of challenges you have experienced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'll, I'll be brave. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so f I'm, I'm one of those students who kind of, through undergrad, like most of you probably, didn't feel like much of my courses were that challenging. And coming into school for the first couple courses, I felt very good. I was succeeding. I was doing well. Um, I had kind of a routine down. And then the start of this year, that kind of got thrown under the bus. Physiology has never been my strong suit and never probably will be my strong suit. And some of the courses at the beginning of the second year are quite physiology heavy. Um, so I kind of tried to do it a few different ways. Um, and my grades just kind of kept falling and falling and falling. And eventually I went and met with Dr. Lineberry, who is um, one of the deans here. And she helped me kind of work out a an academic plan to kind of see if we can change up my my understanding and kind of change my study habits and it was really something for me that had been quite distressing because I was like I don't know what I'm doing I, I my grades are falling and things are getting faster and faster paced um, I felt like I was constantly falling behind but um, I think what was really nice was that there are support systems here so that if you do ever feel like you're in one of those challenges you can reach out and there's always somebody there who can help you and I think when I met with Dr. Lineberry, not only did I feel better, but I gained some different perspectives about how to how to go about my studying, and I think that was very helpful, and it's been it's been helping me since. So um, that's kind of one example of an academic challenge, but there there are certainly other types of challenges that people go through in medical school because um, it is it is um, more all-encompassing of, of your lifestyle than maybe an undergrad. Um, you're, you're kind of uh, always a student 24-7, so um, there are some students who struggle kind of outside of the classroom as well, and there are support systems to help people like that as well. So you guys have any? Um, so one thing about medical school, too, is, yeah, you're still a student. You're surrounded by students. but meta especially the first two years, they can be kind of isolating because you spend so much time staring at a computer screen in your own head trying to memorize things. Um, and I mean, that's something I struggled with first and second year is kind of getting in these ruts of like these habits of, okay, I go to class, then I like go home or go to a coffee shop and I sit on my butt and I study for hours at a time. Um, and so it really just took me recognizing that um, like this isn't really me like I'm I'm a lot more outgoing like I like having friends I like interacting with people and so actually finding time in my schedule and being more um, proactive about finding that time uh, to hang out with people so um, I would say for me my biggest challenge has kind of been unexpected it's not so much day to day but like I just kind of last year was hit with this oh my goodness, this is a long process. Like, this is a marathon, you know? And of course, you know going into, okay, you have four years of medical school, you have X numbers of uh, years of residency, and then you practice. And I was just kind of, um, you know, getting into this mindset of, okay, okay, this is, you know, I'm gonna be working hard at this for a long time. Um, and, you know, what does that mean? And how do all the relationships that I've already built in my life, you know, fit into that and all that kind of stuff. But I think at the end of the day, it just, to help that it comes back to just being grounded where you are. Um, I think UK does a great job of helping with that. You know, the learning communities are just one aspect where you know, you're connected with a group of people. Um, we have full-time psychologists that just work with medical students to help you talk through anything um, and things like that. So I think it, at the end of the day, you know, most of these challenges just come back to having a great support system. And we have small groups once a week, which is about 10 students. And the professor, our preceptor of that class, um, she, we have patient interviews where we're recorded, actually, even though we're just practicing. And we go over the videos, and they give us feedback. But I remember when I met with her one-on-one, -on -one, she also asked me about challenges that I was having. And do you have enough food? And do you have any friends? <laughs> um, and housing challenges. And, and I actually had some housing challenges. And the next time we had class, she had already she had a whole list of stuff for me, and she said she called one of her colleagues and asked their advice, and I don't know. It's just, I, I think they do care about you, and you're, you're not alone if you do have any. 
Yeah, and I just want to re reiterate, uh, the school is really, really focused on wellness. Um, there's tons and tons of resources um, between just talking to a dean or talking to the therapists or um, there's also a student group called Resilience um, that was started by students, for students, um, that emphasizes student wellness and they have wellness representatives that are always free and available to talk to you and be there if you want to vent or um, connect you with the appropriate resources as, as well. So. We have time for perhaps one last question if anyone has anything else they would like to ask. All right, if not, please take advantage of the uh, next hour or so, right? We will all be around, all of these students, myself, you will see lots of other faculty and students. Um, you know, we're here to make sure you get all your questions answered. We're here to try to make sure that before you venture into medical school, you think this is the best fit for you. Um, and I think we've got a lot of great aspects, but please don't take my word on it. Talk to all of our students and faculty and get their impressions on it. So let me turn it over to Dr. Jackson, and she will transition us over into the next section. I will. Thank you, Dr. Fedok. So thank you to the audience, to our accepted students and guests that have come with you, our panel as well, medical students who have come to share their stories. Um, this is actually going to conclude the presentation portion of today's event. However, I have a, a couple of different announcements. If you have been accepted to the Northern Kentucky campus, your regional campus dean, Dr. Steve Hayes, would like to meet with you briefly in Ballroom A. That's number one. Number two, the rest of us will proceed to Ballrooms B and C, where we'll have refreshments and an opportunity to speak to um, faculty members as well as more of our students. There will also be ongoing bus tours, and the space is limited, but we have a total of six tours. The first one will depart at 1130. The loading zone is on the side of the building, and we have some signage out to show you the direction to go for that. And it, obviously, it's going to be a tour of the College of Medicine. So it'll go from here over to the Med Center, 30-minute tour, and then bring you directly back here to the Gatton Student Center. Okay. Thank you all. I see you posted up in the student lounge. Uh, <laughs> I'll see oh, yeah. You posted up. Headphones in. Yeah. Headphones in at an almost horizontal angle, leaning back in my chair. I was <laughs>